So hi, uh, I am um, Alessandro and I um, uh, work as a lecturer at UC Cork and I'm also a research associate at the Center for Subjectivity Research in Copenhagen. Now for this video I've been asked uh, to uh, introduce the notion of intersubjectivity and I thought to do that uh, by uh, starting with some rather uncontroversial claim. Um, and in particular uh, with this one, um, now it seems to me um, fair to say that um, philosophy and empirical sciences uh, converge on the assumption that um, uh, humans are intrinsically uh, social uh, animals. And uh, one important aspect of uh, human sociality is uh, intersubjectivity. Another way of putting this is that um, we are social uh, because we are capable of entering uh, intersubjective relations. But then of course, uh, this leads to the question of what uh, these intersubjective relations are and how do humans um, establish them. Uh, now, this is uh, a hot topic of uh, discussion in, in various disciplines, um, um, empirical and, and philosophical. Uh, but uh, today I would like to focus on the insights that especially classical phenomenologists um, have contributed to this debate. And by classical phenomenologists, um, I mean a number of philosophers who have worked at the beginning of uh, the past century, especially in German speaking countries. Uh, perhaps the most famous of all these phenomenologists uh, was Heidmann Husserl. And the reason why I would like to focus on, on, on their work is that um, um, phenomenologists have developed a, a fairly fine grained uh, theory of intersubjectivity, um, according to which uh, there are uh, at least four forms um, of um, intersubjectivity. Um, and these are uh, emotional contagion, uh, empathy, sympathy, and uh, what they called um, co-experiencing, um, which is a notion more or less coextensive with uh, the more contemporary one of um, collective intentionality. So I would like to go through these uh, four different forms uh, one by one uh, in this presentation. And so let me start with the very first phenomenon, so emotional contagion. And um, um, emotional, uh, the very idea of emotional contagion uh, is based uh, on uh, an everyday uh, observation. Uh, and the observation is simply that uh, emotions have uh, the capacity to pass from one individual uh, to another, often uh, without this individual even being consciously aware of that. Um, so imagine you are, you know, um, having a cup of espresso uh, in Venice, Piazza San Marco, and uh, you see a flock of birds. Now suddenly one of these uh, animals um, perceives um, a threat in the environment, elicits an emotional fear and flies away. Um, and uh, suddenly um, the entire uh, group of animals, this one emotion of fear felt, but this one uh, animal spreads um, over um, all members of the, um, of the group and the entire flock uh, flies away, even though um, it can be uh, said that uh, perhaps even only this one uh, individual animal um, has uh, perceived uh, a threat in the environment. So this observation suggests that um, emotions are contagious and uh, by contagion here, to be a little bit more specific, we mean the fact that uh, the individuals that are at the say receiving end of the contagion process, the infected individuals uh, feel an emotion but do not have um, at least approximate uh, uh, reason for eliciting that emotion. They might have distal reasons but they do not have approximate uh, reason for, for that particular emotion. Um, it is not worthy that uh, sometimes we consciously exploit this emotional phenomenon. So imagine uh, you are in a bit of a depressed mood because you have received uh, bad news. Uh, say uh, your paper hasn't been accepted for publication. So you're a bit depressed, um, but then you decide uh, to join a group of friends uh, who are drinking a pint uh, um, in, in a pub. And you do that because you know that uh, simply being there, simply being exposed to the jolly atmosphere uh, will help you overcome uh, your depressive mood. Um, so you don't have a specific reason uh, for being happy when you join the pub, uh, when you join your friends in the pub, uh, but still their happiness has the capacity to uh, infect you and to modulate uh, your, your own moods. 
So the phenomenon of emotional contagion raises an important question, and this is, well, um, how do we uh, understand uh, the emotions of others? And it is in addressing this question that uh, I move to the second phenomenon discussed, uh, or the second form of intersubjectivity uh, discussed by phenomenologists, which is empathy. Now, some have argued uh, that uh, to understand uh, other emotion is to infer these emotions. And there are different ways of accounting for this um, uh, inference. Some people claim, for instance, that um, um, we understand another emotion when we deploy certain false psychological concepts that um, we have acquired in development, or that means that, um, um, that we, uh, what we actually do when we understand others is uh, that we simulate their emotions in us and then subsequently we attribute those emotions to the other. Uh, and it is, um, I think, interesting to note that uh, these various approaches converge uh, on the assumption, one single assumption, and this, that assumption is that uh, the other mental states are somehow hidden and unobservable and uh, we can get uh, a grasp on them only by means of inference. Now phenomenologists contest uh, that very assumption and rather uh, they argue that the most basic uh, route to understand the other is uh, perceptual. So we have a, a direct understanding uh, uh, of others' emotions, uh, special emotions, but of other mentality more in general, um, by means um, of um, a particular perceptual ability that uh, they call uh, empathy. Now, I would like to uh, somehow qualify this claim, uh, in part, importantly, claiming that uh, we perceive other emotions does not imply that uh, all uh, perceptual experiences about other mental states are veridical. Um, so just as in the case of um, outer perception, we can get things right or wrong. Um, so in the case of empathy, sometimes uh, we get things right, sometimes we are acquainted with the mental states of the other in perception, and sometimes uh, we are not. Sometimes um, uh, our um, uh, acts of empathy are uh, false right? Uh, neither uh, does this claim uh, commit um, phenomenologists to the claim that um, uh, when we empathize with somebody, when we perceive their emotions, then we understand everything uh, uh, about the other's emotion. Um, um, phenomenologists are adamant in saying that uh, not everything is given, not everything about other's emotions is given to us in perception. So for instance, we might need to activate more um, sophisticated abilities um, to uh, understand, uh, say, why uh, somebody feels um, a certain emotion. And also, uh, we will never become acquainted with the subjective character, with the what it is likeness uh, of the other emotion. That is precluded to us, that cannot be given uh, in, in empathy or uh, in perception. So I think it is um, um, uh, important to emphasize that uh, when um, Phenomenologists use the term of uh, empathy, uh, they refer to uh, cognitive experience, right? Despite all the associations that uh, um, English speakers might make uh, with the term empathy, uh, phenomenologists emphasize that um, um, uh, there is a perceptual ability, which they call empathy, and that is a cognitive experience. But uh, it is equally important to, um, uh, to stress uh, that um, uh, empathy as the capacity to ground um, uh, participatory experiences. Um, and what are uh, these participatory experiences? Well, some of them uh, goes, uh, go under the label of uh, sympathy. So now let me uh, say something more about um, uh, sympathy. So other emotions are something that um, we can uh, emotionally respond to. So once uh, we are acquainted with the emotion of somebody, uh, then based on that acquaintance, uh, based on, on that understanding, we have also the capacity to respond uh, to th that emotions. And importantly, uh, this response can come in two different forms. It can be prosocial or participatory, and in this case, uh, uh, phenomenology speak uh, of sympathy. So for instance, um, when you rejoice at somebody's joy, uh, then you are eliciting a prosocial or participatory um, emotion. It is, this is a case of sympathy. Uh, and equally so when you commiserate with somebody else uh, on their sorrow. 
but of course, uh, the response can also be uh, anti-social. So you can be pained by somebody jo somebody's joy, or you can rejoice at somebody's pain. Um, this is uh, uh, notoriously a case of uh, schadenfreude. And in this particular uh, second case, again, you are responding uh, to uh, uh, the emotion of the other, but in an anti-social, in a non-participatory way. Uh, so I would like to uh, disentangle here the intentional structure of sympathy, uh, because that will also help me introduce uh, the last form of uh, intersubjectivity um, uh, I will be discussing in a minute. So uh, imagine that uh, Maria is happy about the fact that uh, one of her papers um, um, has been accepted for publication. And now uh, in empathizing uh, with Maria, uh, Jim first uh, perceives uh, Maria's happiness and then elicits a participatory or sympathetic emotion that is rejoicing uh, about uh, Maria's happiness. Now, interestingly, uh, the intentional objects of Maria emotion is the acceptance of her paper and that uh, intentional object is different from the intentional object of Jim's emotion because the intentional object of uh, Jim's sympathetic emotion is Maria happiness. It's not the acceptance of her paper, but it's rather her happiness. But of course, sometimes uh, there are cases where um, emotions are directed uh, to the same intentional object. And as we will see in a minute, this is one necessary, although not sufficient conditions for um, two or more individual co-experiencing the same uh, emotion. Okay, so let me dwell a little bit more uh, on co-experiencing. So sameness um, of the intentional object is a necessary condition of, for co-experiencing uh, an emotion, as I was saying in a minute. So when you and I co-experience a certain emotion E, then we feel E together or collectively. But um, as I was hinting at, um, um, sameness of intentional object is not sufficient for uh, co-experiencing an emotion. So let me give you an example here. So the two facts, one, that Jim is afraid about the Omicron variant, and two, that Maria is afraid about the Omicron variant, do not yet amount to Jim and Maria's collectively or shared apprehension uh, about the Omicron variant. So there is something more uh, that we need here to turn this scenario into a collective one. So one additional condition one might suggest um, is that individuals know of their respective emotions and know that they know. Um, so in the simplest cases, uh, this can be uh, achieved quite easily uh, despite the complexity of uh, these states of knowledge. Um, so for instance, verbal communication um, has already the capacity to um, establish what sometimes is called common knowledge, but also uh, so-called dyadic empathy uh, can do that. So what do I mean by dyadic empathy? Well, I mean a case where uh, one object uh, empathizes uh, with another object and the second, ob um, and the second subject uh, empathizes with the first subject. So for instance, the worried Maria, uh, the worried um, uh, Maria perceives uh, the worried Jean uh, perceiving her and the worried Jean perceives the worried Maria perceiving him. And yet uh, this uh, second condition is not um, sufficient uh, either. So imagine the following scenario. So queuing at the supermarket counter, uh, Jim, just as Maria, to uh, individuals that uh, do not know each other, these two individuals notices a person coughing repeatedly. And uh, this fact makes each of them uh, worried and each of them notices that the other two uh, feels worried about the very same thing. So um, here we have a case where um, uh, there is sameness of the intentional correlate of the two emotions and there is common knowledge. Um, however, these two facts, uh, the facts that James and Maria are worrying about uh, the same thing and the fact that they know that they do so, do not yet amount uh, to sharing their worry. These are two um, states um, of worrying uh, that, uh, as it were, are running in parallel. So there is something else uh, that here uh, is missed. Um, and what is it? Well, um, it is fair to say that in the previous scenario, each of the two individuals um, worries in light of an individual reason. 
say, uh, the concern for uh, individual well-being. Uh, but for the apprehension uh, to be shared, for the worry to be shared, um, uh, it must be felt in light um, of a group reason. So in the collective case, the coughing individual is a danger to Jean and Maria's well-being, to their well-being, to their collective well-being. Uh, so it is a danger to them together. And another way of putting this is that uh, Jean worries as a member of a group, which might encompass more individuals than itself, Maria, and so on. And so does Maria. So what is at stake uh, in the collective scenario is the fact that uh, the two emotions, um, uh, you know, are responding um, to a reason uh, that is not an individual reason, or not only an individual reason, but also, and importantly, a group or a group reason. Um, I would like to uh, make one last remark uh, before coming to an end, um, and um, and the remark is this one. So. For Jim uh, or Maria to emotionally respond to a group uh, reason, Jim must have a specific self-understanding. Uh, in particular, uh, Jim or Maria uh, must understand uh, themselves as group members. So um, the, the case of co-experiencing um, relies on um, or presupposes a particular self-understanding of uh, the uh, individuals involved. And here again, as you can imagine, it is a big question, how exactly are we supposed to cash out this uh, particular self-understanding as a group member? But this is a topic uh, for another video. Okay, so let me recap here. Um, I have argued, or I've said that part of what makes us uh, social animals is the capacity to enter into subjective relations. And um, um, phenomenologists, um, I have um, said, um, understand intersubjectivity in as a complex concept and it is a concept con concept according to phenomenologists because um, uh, um, it um, you know encompasses at least four different forms of intentionality and uh, or sorry four different forms of intersubjectivity and uh, these four different forms are uh, contagion empathy sympathy and co-experiencing Right, so I the end of my uh, presentation. So thank you for your attention and goodbye.